Hey everyone, this is Wade Thomas, the Black Tie Bar and Candle Company. We're going to do a little bit different type of video today. Uh, today I'm here with with Bob. Uh, Bob reached out to me with a few questions that he had, and, and in our discussions of those questions, we realized this is probably a good opportunity to to go ahead and record this because other viewers have similar questions. In fact, these questions that Bob brought up are very common questions, and so rather than just ans answering individually for him, we thought it would be beneficial to to address these uh, on a larger scale to help other candle makers as well. So before we get started on those questions, um, Bob, do you want to take a sec to, I guess, say who you are and where you're from and how long you've been making candles and I guess your journey to this point so far? Sure. My name's uh, Bob Granada and I live in White Plains, New York. And I've been making candles and soaps for going on about three years now. And uh, I just started kind of like many others. I went into a local supply store, hobby shop. I found this little, you know, kit on uh, one on making candles and one on making soaps. Just took them home kind of as a lark to play with them. And uh, I got hooked on it. And, you know, it just kind of became an obsession. And I've spent way too much money on it, but I really enjoy it. Yeah, no, I, I'm I 100% with you there. I'm, you may or may or not have seen a, another video I posted not too long ago about how I got started as well. It was very similar. It was about oh, probably 12 years ago, and it was a very similar experience. I kind of did it as you know off the cuff, almost kind of like a joke. I just wanted to see what it would be like, and then uh, and like you said, you get hooked. And then when you realize how complicated and difficult it really is, it, it makes that just that much more interesting. And so. It doesn't take a lot to get to get hooked on this. So, well, with that being said, I'm, I'm glad you reached out to me and hopefully I can address some of these questions for you. And, um, you know, we'll just start tackling them one at a time. And so we're going to start with the one that really kicked off our conversation, which and I'll try to summarize the question. But then if you wouldn't mind, I guess, adding a little bit more perspective and details to it. Um, but I believe the main question was you reached out to me about some some trouble you're having wicking. Um, your uh, Libby jar, and that's a that's a, a complicated jar to wick um, to begin with, just because of the diameter. It's kind of in that in that range between, you know, single wick is almost too small and a double wick is too much, and so that that size diameter of around three to three and a half inches is pretty tough. And so you reached out about some tips on that because you had read things about you know needing to have a full melt pool in in, in three or four hours and a quarter inch deep, and typically if you do that, it can be overwicked. And so your concern was, if I do too much less, they don't want to be underwicked. And I guess where's that happy medium to make sure you're properly sized? Is that is that about right? If, if Feel free to tackle that a little bit more. That, that is exactly right. That's how it started. Uh, actually, just to back up for a second, you know, I had been on the internet, and I had read all these different kinds of news groups. I was so pumped up on candle making that I go down to my local dollar store. I see these Libby jars and they're gorgeous. You know, I'm like, wow, you know, you can even get tops for them because I've seen stores like Candle Science uh, sell the tops. So, so I got to buy these. They're a dollar a piece of like a whole case of them. I took them home. You know, I thought it was going to be a cinch to wick them. So I started getting uh, sample wicks and uh, I realized it wasn't that easy. If I would have a full melt pool, which I thought really you're supposed to have within two hours or something's wrong, uh, it would then heat up when it got down to about the midpoint. And, uh, you know, it's unacceptable. Like you had once said, you're in this to make like perfect candles. I mean, much better than your commercially produced ones. And that's kind of what I was trying to do also. So um, my big mistake was starting to switch waxes too. I think, well, you know, I started with joy wax and I said, let me try 464, let me try 6006. Now I really screwed myself up because I was buying every wick sampler I could possibly find. And I was then starting to, to change wicks um, and, and waxes midstream. So I really just had to take a break from it for a while and I settled in on one wax. And currently I'm using Joy Wax. And I started um, wicking them a little, a little more um, slowly. I was going fast and furiously, you know. And um, I was writing everything down. I still couldn't find a wick 
that I was happy with. And then I realized that I was over wicking. I was getting a lot of flickering flames, a lot of soot. And when I backed off a little bit and just did a burn or two, and a burn for me is four hours, four to five hours, you know, then I'll put it out. Um, I realized that uh, I might have had a little hang up of wax on the sides, but it would catch up. By the time I got to the halfway point, it looked pretty good. And uh, as long as it's not left on the sides, I thought that was acceptable. So I kind of learned something just from my own trial and error, which I guess is the best way to learn. And that's kind of where I am now. Um, I didn't want to go to um, I didn't want to go to uh, a wooden wick, and I didn't want to go to a double wick just because I really like the beauty of a single cotton wick. And I, I'm, I was going to get it one way or the other. So that's kind of brought me, I saw your wicking video and I said, well, this is the person to ask, you know, so that's why I wrote you. And uh, here we are. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for the, the really good explanation. And you are, I mean, you're hitting the, the nail on the head. That's the, the this is a common issue that a lot of people deal with, um, and, and including myself. And the, the good news is, is your approach, the way you're thinking about it is 100% right. I mean, you're, you're, you're ahead of the curve just because you're considering that instead of just assuming that you've got a full melt pool at two or three hours, so you must be good to go because that is a dangerous mistake. And that is typically when you see some disasters, shattered jars, smoke, fires, that kind of thing. So you're definitely thinking the right way. So to, to answer these, this a little bit more, well, and, and first let me back up and address the last thing you said about double wicking and wood wicks. So you're right. One of the go-to solutions for jars that are difficult to wick is if it's kind of too, too big for one wick and almost too small for double wicks, you'll see people often recommend a wood wick. Now, I will mention that as an option to people just because some people are already using wood wicks. But if you're not using wood wicks, and introducing woodworks have their own challenges. So, um, so we won't really talk about that option, but that is something you'll generally see people use on certain size jars just because it is so difficult to wick with a cotton wick. But again, using woodworks has its own set of challenges. Same thing can be said about double wicks. Double wicks um, really should be used in about four inch jars or, or larger as a standard rule of thumb. You can use them on three and a half size inch jars but you're starting to really, you know, you're really kind of flirting a little fire there, so to speak. Um, it's, uh, it's really difficult to be consistent with that. You have to wick down so much just to avoid um, excess heat with that as well. And it can be difficult to do. And again, double wicking has its own challenges as well. So with those out of the way, let's focus back on what you're trying to achieve, which is one single wick. The short answer to this question is that you are correct. A little bit of hang up is completely fine. In fact, it is much more preferable to have a little bit of hang up than to have none. Because as you said, if you don't have hang up about halfway down the jar, it's going to start getting very hot and very dangerous. And especially the lower and lower it gets down in the jar, you're just, you're really asking for trouble. And so that to give a little bit of history on candle making and why that rule exists about, you know, uh, one inch um, or one hour for each inch of diameter is kind of the rule that you hear a lot of new candle makers refer to. And to be honest, that started with um, paraffin candles and harder waxes in general, hard paraffins and even some of your hard soys. And the reason was, is you had to prevent tunneling and those harder type waxes uh, would tunnel if you didn't get enough burn across the top and you had to continue that uh, that burn rate through the entire entirety of the jar it would start to tunnel. These days there are so many different types of waxes. Some are soft, some are low melt points, some are viscous, some are not, many blends out there. They all burn very differently so you can't really have a general rule of thumb that applies to all wax types. You just can't. If, if you follow the one inch diameter per hour rule with a really hard paraffin wax, or a really high melt point, uh, like 6006 blend. And then you follow that same rule with something low point like a Joy Wax or a Pro Blend 600, uh, you're gonna end up over wicked. And, and again, that's, that's not what we're trying to do here. So my, my advice is, obviously it depends mostly on the wax they're using. You know your wax, you've started to learn how it behaves already, so that's the best start, is really testing with your own wax. 
But my general advice, now again, this depends on the type of wax, but my general advice would be your first burn or two, so maybe eight to 10 hours into your candle, uh, there probably should be a tiny bit of hang up. Now you don't want it to be more than a quarter inch, maybe an eight, eighth of an inch all the way around is completely fine. In fact, you're probably on good track if that's what you've got. And then as long as I about halfway down, that hang up is starting to disappear. Um, and then, then you're, then you're, that's kind of your next benchmark. And once you've reached that, by the time you're, you're basically done with the candle, it should be fully consumed. Now you might still have a little bit of, you know, kind of smudge and, and residue on the side of the jar, but that's, again, that's completely normal and certain waxes are stickier and that's just going to happen. There's nothing you can do about that. Um, what I would say is to avoid trying to get that full melt pool across the top on your first burn and your second burn. Um, the only way that is going to work successfully for customers is if they are 100% religious about trimming their wick every single burn perfectly, never burning more than three or four hours at a time. You might be able to get away with that. The problem is, is no one does that. We all know that customers don't do that. We don't even do that with our own candles half the time. So um, you just, I, I think it's a much safer approach to wick for the bottom two thirds of the jar. Now I always test from the top because I want to make sure that if I do leave a little bit of hang up on the first burn or two, that it will catch up. Um, you just don't want that hang up to be too much as all. Well. And so that, that would be my, my general advice to that question. Um, it's kind of a tough, tough one to answer because as you pointed out, it's so wax specific, but you're on the right track. Um, if I think you're, I think you can do this with a single wick and just not focus too much on trying to, you know, get a quarter inch all the way full across the uh, melt pool across the top. Um, and you know, it, it will catch up. Now some waxes are better about it than others, but it's completely normal. So that would be my answer to that first question. I hope that that helps a little bit. It actually does. And I appreciate it. I'm not quite satisfied with my efforts yet, but I have a path to get there. And uh, I guess the journey's half the fun. And that's where I am now. So I appreciate that. You know, one, one thing you could do too, Bob, and, and um, it, I don't know that we mentioned, if you wouldn't mind mentioning to everyone what wax you're using again, I can't, re can't recall if you said. I'm using uh, Nature's Garden Joy Wax, which I learned from you is pretty much the same as the Pro Blend 600. Yes. Yep. So the, so the good news about that wax is, Fortunately, you picked a wax that is easier among some other options to wick with a single wick um, in the Libby jar. If you were to try to do that with 6006, not happening, <laughs> it's the, or at least, at least in a very good way. That's when you see people switch to wood wicks. Um, you know, the Joy Wax is soft enough. It's got a low enough melt point. It's not overly viscous that it can take a single wick pretty effectively, even at that size. Um, one thing you can try if you haven't already, um, I... I'm not sure what wicks, specific wicks you're using at this point, but you might, you may, uh, you know, try a sample a few other wicks, some hotter burning ones to see if they give you a little bit more reach, but without being too oversized. But you do have to be careful because the hotter the wick, the more it's going to consume, the right. more it, it could start mushrooming. So it's, it's finding that happy balance. That's exactly what happened to me. I went to a hotter burning wick. I think it was the hemp series. Mm. And I got a little better performance, but I got these huge mushrooms and it was really burning hot. And I just, that was one of the wicks that I was like a little hesitant to, uh, to really go ahead with because you know, one, I really don't want it to get too hot. Like you said, halfway down, three quarters of the way down. So most of the people I, I get feedback from on my candles, I tell them, I, I try to, I try to tell them only four hours, trim the wick. Here's how you do it. And it's like, they still do power burns, you know, yeah. eight hours in, you know, so it's going to happen. So like you said, you've really got to, you've really got a wick for the, the mid and the bottom three quarters. Yep. Well, um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to tackle that question first because it was your initial question and I'm sure we'll have some more conversations about that as well. So I wanted to spend a little extra time on that. But uh, let's go ahead and jump into to your next question, um, and it was about curing candles with lids or not. If you want to go ahead and answer, ask that question more specifically. Well, I I'm more now into curing candles 
a little bit longer than I did. I used to melt a candle and just light it up that night and try to get a good test from it. Now, I try to go by the manufacturer's recommendation. I was happy that Joy Wax recommends maybe two days. Yeah. But I let it go that two days, and I do notice a difference, especially if I scent the candle. I frequently don't test with scent to start, but when I do have scent in it, I notice a difference in two or three days. It's, it just seems more, more rounded. And I started thinking about curing. And I was wondering, I have lids, and I was like, should I leave the lid on while I cure my candle, or should I leave it off? And I, I wasn't sure if this curing happens on a molecular level and would matter if there was a cap on it or not, or does it somehow use oxidation? So it would, re, you know, the oxygen hitting it with um, a candle curing with no lid might be better than a candle with the lid. So I, I saw benefits doing both. And I, I didn't know if one was better than the other or it's just whatever you please. Sure. So that was my question. Well, um, actually I'll address a couple things there. Um, and, and again, I, you know, I, I am not an a, a expert on across everything by, by any means. These are just kind of, you know, just sharing my experiences and my, my insight to this. Um, you know, I, I think there are, there are a lot of different opinions on these type of topics for sure. But from my perspective, um, first, before I forget to mention it, you mentioned Joy Wax, you cured for two days, and how, what kind of impact that has. Like, is it curing done on a molecular structure? Well, the answer to that is for soy, definitely. The, the soy, um, its, it's, its makeup and its molecules do take a longer time to kind of resettle and solidify and kind of come back together. And so that's why you see a lot of recommendations of waiting a few days, a week, even two weeks for complete soy waxes like 464. Joy Wax, you're right. Um, they recommend about two days and you're, and you're good to go. Um, I will say that I tend to, the way I look at this is I never make a candle and my customer's burning it at day two. That doesn't happen. It, they're at least not going to be receiving it um, till, you know, probably day three or four, if I make a fresh batch. And then by the time they burn it, you're talking about a week out. And that's if I made it fresh for them. A lot of times if I already have stock, it's already been sitting there much longer than that. So I like to try to test my candles in the same type of scenario that the customer would be burning them. And so I will tend to test with Joy Wax a little bit later, uh, about five days. Um, and I, I notice even a little bit more difference after about a week than I do two days. And that way I'm also more confident that the, the wax, since it is 50% soy roughly, you've given it enough time to really cure and solidify and settle back down to where it should be. Um, I have noticed wicking differences um, at day one versus a couple weeks later um, or a week later. So um, I, I do agree with you. Giving it a couple extra days is definitely beneficial. And you may even consider that stretching out a bit further, but Mm -hmm. to the main question, curing with lids or not. So the lids aren't going to actually affect curing at all. Um, the, the curing is really of the, of the soy resolidifying with the other additives like the oil, yeah, the oils and the, the, any other additives and the dye. Um, the lids really more than anything are just, or any kind of cover is just to keep debris, dust out of your candles. Now, a lot of people will, do believe that covering them will also increase throw um they in their minds it's keeping the the scent from escaping while it's cooling um mm -hmm. i wouldn't necessarily do it for that reason uh I, whether a lid's on or not if scent is is leaving the liquid it's not just going to return back to the liquid just because a lid's on now that being said you could get a better cold throw from the jar and the lid itself just because it is being exposed to more of that, that, that fragrance. Um, and so I, I, I can, I can would definitely agree that it could help with if a can if a customer were to pick a candle off the shelf, open the lid, you might get a little bit better throw that way than if you were to put the lid on three weeks later, for example. Um, but I wouldn't worry about it hot throw and how it's going to affect the burning of the candle or the hot throw. And so my, what I do with my candles is after I pour them, depending on the wax I'm using, they're either uncovered or I have them covered in a tin that you may have seen in some of my videos. Um, and I will do that for the first 24 hours 
um, at the most, sometimes 12 hours, basically a point where I feel like they're solidified enough that if I pick them up or move them, I'm not going to disturb it. And then I'll usually lid them after that. But again, that's mostly to keep dust and debris and, you know, foreign, foreign elements out of it. I think that's a good point. I'm going to probably stretch the, uh, the curing out to about four or five days. Um, I usually won't give a candle to someone after two days myself, right. but um, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. And um, I can't hurt. Exactly. Yep. 